Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny LeRae. Thank you so much for joining today's Research America Alliance discussion. As we always say, and will continue to say, your partnership with us is extremely valuable. If your organization isn't a member, we invite you to please stay on uh, today's program as our guest, but perhaps you'll get in touch with my colleague Joel and he can talk to you more about um, the benefits of uh, having your organization join our alliance. Our special guest today is Robert Gebbia, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And today's conversation is a particularly timely one, although um, I think this is always a timely topic, but September is National Suicide Prevention Month. Bob will be speaking with us today about the work that his association is doing and what we can do collectively as advocates, as peers, as friends, as family members uh, in suicide prevention. So as always, please type your questions in the Q&A chat, um, the Q&A box or the chat, and we'll pose as many as we can. So Bob, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, for um, having me and, and for really talking about a subject that unfortunately sometimes doesn't get enough conversation. And that's part of what we see as something we wanna change. We do need to talk about this issue. So greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, with colleagues here about this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, it is timely. Um, September is National Suicide Prevention Month. It's a point in the year where there is certainly more avenues and venues for getting out the message about prevention and getting out information about how to prevent suicide to the public. And so there is a lot of attention this month. Next slide, please. But you know, more importantly, it is a year round effort. And uh, the other thing that has happened, which I'm sure uh, most, of, most of you know, is that mental health and suicide prevention became higher priorities um, as a result of the pandemic. And um, you know, it was going in that direction before, but the pandemic certainly um, shed a light on mental health being as important as any other aspect of our health and also concerns about the pandemic's impact perhaps on suicide. So we'll talk more about that. Next slide. So what were some of the impacts? Well, it certainly impacted our mental health, isolation, human loss, social political unrest at the same time, and increased depression and anxiety and substance use. Some of the surveys showed pretty dramatic increases in depression and anxiety and substance use, and also um, in suicidal ideation. So clearly um, the impact on our mental health was pretty significant uh, and obviously financial loss, which also can affect um, our mental health and suicide, but there also were positives. And as I mentioned, it became a priority, much more conversation about it. The use of telemental health became uh, an aspect during the pandemic that we had not had before. And that we believe is here to stay. There was new federal funding. There was also a focus on health disparities um, coming out of some of the social unrest. And like every other field, I think the mental health field, the suicide prevention field didn't focus on underrepresented communities, certainly not enough and not like we're doing today. More information was out there and it helped to reduce the stigma. And we certainly saw in our programming, uh, AFSP's programming, a lot more increase for demand, demand for our work and, and information. So there were, there were positives to go along with those negatives uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I, I believe a lot of these positives will be with us long after the pandemic is gone. Next slide, please. So what about AFSP? How do we fit into this? Well, our mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Uh, next slide. Um, as like many of you, we are a voluntary health organization and we give really voice to those affected by suicide as a way to engage them uh, in our work. That's a wide cross section of people personally affected. Some have lost a loved one. Some have loved ones who struggle. Some struggle themselves. And we do it like many of you, we engage in, in research and we support research with the largest private funder of suicide research. Uh, education, both public and professionals, and, and also advocacy. Next slide. Uh, we work nationally and we also work locally. We have 74 chapters across all 50 states. Uh, that's only in the last seven or eight years that we've had nationwide coverage. 
and it really is growing in terms of our local uh, impact. And, and that's an important part of how we believe suicide can be prevented. We're also excited that recently we formed a chapter in Puerto Rico, something that's been in the works um, for a while and, and finally happened uh, just a few months ago. Next slide. So how do we think about this? Well, we think of suicide as a health issue. And you know, like, like many of you, the, the organizations that work in, in this space, you know, if it's a health issue, then we need to find out how to prevent um, the, the worst outcome of any health issue, which is mortality. Um, how do we do that? But if you, if suicide hasn't always been thought of that, about that way. Many times we used to hear, not as much now, but that this is, this is a personal choice. It's the person's decision. They have, you know, they have um, uh, personality and they don't, you know, it's selfish. I mean, you get all those terrible things that are said. You would never say that in other health issues. But once you start viewing suicide through the lens of being a health issue, then it opens up all kinds of possibilities to change attitudes and also how to, uh, how to approach prevention. Next slide. So if it's a health issue, we need to figure out how, but then we have the, the view that it can be prevented. Um, and you know, suicide hasn't always been viewed that way, by even by clinicians, even by professionals. Uh, that is really changing. I'm going to share some public opinion uh, polling that we did uh, a little later to show the public is actually moving very quickly to believing that suicide is a preventable cause of death. Next slide. So what is the scope of the problem? How significant is this problem? Next slide. So this is some of the latest data. It's from 2020, which is the latest we have. Uh, in a couple of months, we'll have the data from 2021 from CDC. But in 2020, it was the 12th leading cause of death in the US. And we lost almost 46,000 people in the US to suicide, those are reported deaths. Um, someone dies every 40 seconds. Um, one of the things that is most of concern is that it has been trending up, not dramatically, but slightly among youth. And uh, that's of concern. Uh, certainly any suicide, any person dying of suicide is tragic. But we also realize that when a young person dies, it, it almost seems like we've, it, it's truly failed. So, so that has been trending up, and, and that is of concern. The highest rates in 2020 were among young adults. 25 to 34. That is a, a shift from prior years where we saw the highest rates among older adults. So we're starting to see some alarming trends um, in, in the scope of the problem, so to speak. Uh, and for every suicide uh, death, there are about 25, an estimated 25 attempts. So when you do the math, you'll see that there's an estimated 1.2 million suicide attempts in our country every year. This is just in the US, this is not worldwide. And, and it's not tracked, um, so these are estimates, but we do know that that alone causes just an enormous amount. It takes a terrible toll on families. Our healthcare system has to you know, really address that. And it's just an enormous, enormous problem um, as well. And the impact, as you know, and everyone knows on families, friends, schools, workplaces, our military, you know, uh, communities across the, the board. It's, it's just a tremendous toll that it takes. Next slide. So what about risk? What do we think about risk? What do we know about it? Well, the risk factors really are in, in three buckets. There's underlying health conditions, there's historical information, um, and then there's environmental factors. Next slide. So on health, it's, it's primarily mental health conditions, right? Depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, just a whole range of things. And, and often when you see reports about suicide, for some reason, um, substance use disorder is not included in those health conditions. That is a mistake because it is, a, it is a addiction. It is a mental health condition, diagnosable, treatable. Um, and it plays a big part in about a third of all suicides, alcohol alone plays a part. So these are the kind of underlying health conditions that uh, feed into the risk. Next slide. But there are other things, serious or chronic um, health conditions, chronic pain. Uh, many of your organizations have conditions that create disability and pain, chronic pain. Uh, and, and there's a comorbidity uh, often 
with other conditions, uh, other physical health conditions, along with the mental health conditions. And as we've learned increasingly, serious head injury does have, um, can be a factor in, in risk for suicide. Next slide. Historical factors, family history, uh, history of mental health um, conditions, early childhood abuse has been strongly linked and early childhood trauma strongly linked to, to an outcome of suicide uh, later in life. Previous attempts is another historical factor we need to look at. And also it, it, loss itself, traumatic loss um, and, and traumatic grief can play a part. Next slide. Environmental factors, um, and these are very important in our field. The research is pretty clear. Access to lethal means plays a role. It can also play a role in prevention if you could put some separation between the person who is in a suicidal crisis and access to the means to take their life. Uh, in the US, um, the biggest concern is around firearms because we don't say this publicly very often because we don't want to draw attention to it, but firearms is the most lethal means um, of taking your life. And so it accounts in 2020 for about 52% of all suicide deaths were using a firearm. So if you can separate that person from the firearm or other means, the data is pretty strong. The, uh, the suicidal crisis is very short in terms of time. And, and if you can have that separation, you can save lives. And so that's a, an area, but it is a fact. Exposure and contagion. We've seen these kind of contagion reports when there's a suicide, let's say on a college campus, and there's a lot of publicity about it, and they talk about the means. It actually does, can have a contagion effect on someone who is struggling. And we do see copycat suicides. It is a factor. Prolonged stress and other life events that could, you know, really um, have a person become somewhat hopeless pretty quickly in times, and, and that's a fact. Next, next slide. There are also protective factors, and, and sadly, I think our field has not looked into these as much um, as it has into some of the risk factors, but we do know mental health care is a protective factor. If you can get someone into treatment, you have a good chance of reducing suicide as an outcome. Family and community supports, Problem solving skills, especially teaching them at a young age, is shown some real promise. Uh, so how to cope with certain things when you're faced with adversity can be um, a, a protective factor over time. And, and cultural, religious, and religious beliefs also play a role there. So this is a complicated condition, right? Uh, suicide is not a health condition itself. It's an outcome of it. But there's lots of factors that can lead to it. Next slide. And the mental health part is really important. And, and we have taken, certainly from a public policy point of view, a strong position on, on having affordable, accessible and affordable mental health care uh, as a, a way to help prevent suicide as an outcome. Next slide. And mental health parity is 15 years uh, from when it, it passed Congress and signed into law. And still, it is not fully implemented. Insurance companies um, have not fully embraced it as they are supposed to, um, and even in Medicare, Medicaid has. It. So we still have a long way to go. Some states have done well with it and some haven't. So ensuring that people have coverage for mental health at the same rate as they have it for physical health is still a challenge. It still has to happen. The bigger problem is also there are many, many providers in the mental health area that do not take insurance. So that becomes an issue around affordability. If you can find a provider and there's a shortage of workforce, and we may wanna come back and talk about that uh, later, but this is a major major barrier. And without help, uh, and if you're struggling, that's a lethal gap and something we really have to close. Next slide. So a few highlights from some of our work. We do a lot in terms of um, public education, mental health literacy, Understanding if someone is struggling that you know, what can you do, how to intervene, toolkits, language, things that, that really help the public. And, and our most basic is our Talk Saves Lives Introduction to Suicide Prevention. We delivered about 2,000 programs virtually and in person last year, mostly through our chapters. We now have a Spanish version. We have modules for older adults for use in workplaces. 
for firearms owners, very specific for LGBTQ audiences. This is one of our most popular programs and it is really aimed at educating the public. We also have resources like It's Real, Teens in Mental Health, very popular program focusing on youth, supporting those at risk. If you have someone in your family, how to, how to support that person and finding hope is, is also guidance for supporting those at risk. So these are programs that we launched aimed at really trying to have a, a higher public knowledge and education on what to do. Next. We also have had, a, as many of you have, I'm sure, increased attention to uh, DEI. You know, our field, as I mentioned earlier, was not very good at, at keeping up with that and focusing on underrepresented and underserved populations. Uh, that's changing in the mental health field. It's changing in the suicide prevention field. Uh, at AFSP, we um, formed a partnership with the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, which has allowed us to really develop more culturally appropriate content and make it available in Spanish. We have a lot of programming now in the LGBTQ population, uh, for the LGBTQ population. We're closer with our colleague organizations like the Trevor Project. Uh, and some of, the, some of the more advocacy um, kinds of uh, uh, human rights groups in LGBT space where we've really partnered with them. We do a quarterly town hall series focusing on some aspect of suicide prevention and mental health in these underrepresented and underserved uh, populations. You might notice in that picture there, for those of you involved in advocacy, um, Congresswoman Bonnie uh, Watson Coleman, who's a, a real champion for legislation in this space, was part of a program we did. And we also changed our research priorities to have them state very specifically, we are looking to fund more studies into underserved populations and researchers from those communities. And we've started to get a good response to that. We've had that now for a few years. Next slide. We also do a lot of programming for those who've lost a loved one. Healing Conversations is a, is a program that is for the recently bereaved uh, to talk with a trained volunteer, kind of like a friendly visitor approach. And our International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day has gone international. It's in about 20 countries. It happens every Saturday before Thanksgiving. And it's a really important way to, to really provide support. It's not clinical. It's more social support, um, the message that you're not alone, and hearing from people who, who are further along in their lost journey. Next slide. We also have something called the Interactive Screening Program. There's information on all of these things on our website. But this is an interesting one because it's an anonymous engagement tool it does screen, it's kind of a self-check quiz. It's working really well at colleges and workplaces, and healthcare settings. We have a contract with the VA, it's part of their veterans crisis line and community settings. And what it really is doing, it's engaging people who are struggling and not asking for help in a way that is feels safe and, and anonymous and yet linking them eventually, hopefully, to, um, to a resource. It works with EAP programs in the workplace setting. It works with the counseling centers and schools. And this has really grown in use. We've already connected about a quarter of a million people through this program. Next slide. We fund 34 studies this past year and um, focused on suicide research, a uh, wide range, as you can see, covering all kinds of aspects of it from the hard sciences to the social sciences and community interventions, clinical work. It really is wide open, but it has to be focused on suicide prevention. And we did a summit with an international group where we had about, um, researchers from about 37 countries uh, talk about gaps in knowledge and so on. We co-hosted that with our partners there. And that's an ongoing thing we do every other year. Next slide. So what are some of the, um, the research findings. I'm going to go through this really fast. Uh, hopefully, you can have access to these slides and this information is on our website. But um, it, suicide is related to brain functioning. It affects decision making and, and behavioral control. Uh, and when someone's affected that way, it's really hard to think logically. So when you say, oh, you have a lot to live for, it doesn't work um, because they're not thinking logically. Um, we also, as I mentioned, limiting access uh, has a dramatic impact on reducing suicide. About 90% of people who die by suicide do have an underlying and treatable mental health condition. Um, you can see some of those. Um, and, but there are interventions that are really showing, uh, psychological interventions that are showing really strong 
um, results. Uh, one of the problems is they've not been taken to scale and there's not as many clinicians who are uh, trained in it. And that's a problem in trying to deal with you know, people who seek help to use these evidence-based interventions. It's been a, something we're focused on and it, it has been too slow, frankly. Next, uh, next slide. Um, there isn't a single reason someone says, oh, well, they, they're going through a divorce, they broke up or their you know, partner or something. That, it, there's never a single reason. It's a combination of things. And it's, it's almost the perfect cocktail of underlying health conditions, something happening in their life that causes um, uh, a reaction where they, they become hopeless and, and can't see their way out of it. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's never that simple. And sometimes the media reports say, oh, well, this happened, therefore. That's not, it's never that simple. It is a combination. Uh, if you ask somebody, if they're thinking about suicide, it doesn't put the idea in their head and it actually can help get a conversation going where they might open up about it. Some medications have been very effective in showing um, uh, a reduction in suicidal thinking and behavior. Um, and again, if you can get somebody through that very short but intense suicidal crisis, the data shows they, they go on to live and not die by suicide in most cases. So um, it is an important uh, moment to intervene. That's why the crisis line 988 as we'll talk about is so important. Next slide, please. We do a lot of advocacy as many of your, your organizations do, and we were a major proponent for 988, uh, setting it up and, and in this past year to have it fully implemented and have the resources needed. There's been real progress there uh, in terms of the federal investment. Some states have done a good job, some haven't. That continues to be a priority at the state level for us to see those investments, to build out the crisis response system we need. Um, we do capital uh, days in all states and DC. Uh, this past year, we championed uh, over 200 bills and we had about a quarter of them signed into law. A lot of those bills are about uh, teacher training or uh, healthcare professional training um, to everything to like red flag laws on firearms uh, to, to have a way to have a firearm removed from the home when someone's at risk for hurting themselves or others. We have about 40,000 volunteer field advocates uh, as of this time who, who engage locally as well as in federal advocacy for us. Next slide. So 988 is live. Um, it's a big accomplishment in our field um, because if you can intervene at the moment of crisis, you can save lives. And, and uh, it was undervalued and underfunded. Next slide. But it's just the beginning to a transition to a more robust and more comprehensive crisis response system. Next slide. What does that mean? Well, you know, we have to build out the local crisis centers. 988 works as an entry point, and then you your roll over to a, a local crisis center uh, closest to where you're calling from. And, you know, some of those local centers don't have the capacity that needs to be strengthened. Uh, or we will see an increase in, in uh, wait times and drop calls, and that's certainly uh, very dangerous. Um, but we, you know, we need to have trained, adequate, culturally competent uh, centers. It's happening, but it is slow. It is slow. Next slide. We also think there's other things that have to change, and it's starting, and this needs a lot of advocacy too. Use of mobile crisis. It's clear that that's a much better um, uh, when there is an in-person response, and I should say that when someone calls 988 or the old lifeline number, um, nine out of 10 people do not need um, an in-person response. It's pretty rare, actually. It's, it's only about um, four or 5%. And most can have their issues addressed during the call. Um, but when it is needed, mobile crisis with trained professionals is better. Reduce reduced on law enforcement. Reduce, reduce reliance on emergency departments, which are often not uh, really geared to handle people who come in at a suicidal crisis. So there are changes we can make. Next slide. Uh, this is what we think it should look like. Um, you know, outreach and engagement, call centers that are fully uh, to capacity, mobile crisis when needed. And this is kind of a continuum. You know, most people can, you can address it in the first slide uh, or even, the, the second slide, but when it's needed, mobile crisis. And then stabilization centers are becoming a more um, 
effective way rather than emergency departments because you can immediately start providing mental health care with a trained mental health professional rather than sitting in an emergency room where they may not have a place to put you. And you may be boarded there. Actually, we've had horror stories where people are boarded for, for days. And so without any care and then release because there's nothing else to do. Uh, hospitalization does play a role, although most do not need that. And so crisis stabilization centers are a better option, except in the most case, worst cases where people need hospitalization. And then post-crisis support. I mean, the lack of follow-up after a crisis is something that has to be addressed. So we do think it can save lives, but we need a different model. This is the model we're working for with lots of partner organizations in the mental health area, NAMI and um, Mental Health America and others. This is something we work together on. Next slide. So we're a leading voice for public education um, and reaching millions with our, our outreach and our uh, public education work. Next slide. This is Suicide um, you know, Prevention Month. And, and these are the kinds of shareables we come up with and get it out to um, our network, which is pretty large now. And, and we also use influencers and others to go way beyond our network. And it's having a lot of reach. And, and if you make it easy with these messages and, and provide the information, we find others will, will help uh, spread that word. Next slide. We also uh, promote our walks this month. We have 400 walks going on this fall, all over the country, large markets, small markets. It's it's a great way to raise awareness. It obviously raises funds for us for our work, but it also engages people. And that's been a really important part of our strategy because historically people who struggled or lost a loved one did not engage. They were quite alone. And that's, that's a big change and it's been an important strategy. And the walks are a great vehicle for that. Next. There's also loss and healing messages that we get out regularly. Um, another constituency we want to try to help because uh, it's a very, very isolated experience when you lose a loved one. Next slide. And you know our social media reach has grown dramatically. It's a, between our chapters and our national pages, it's about 1.1 million. We do use paid uh, social media as well and the number of media impressions. And we have a really strong social media team that's getting these messages out. They run the gamut for you know, what to do and, and uh, how to talk about this to um, how to seek help and all of those, those important prevention messages. Next slide. We also have some partnerships. A big one is with Odyssey. Uh, they have, you know, two, I think it's 250 radio stations around the country. Um, we've been a beneficiary of their big concert at Hollywood Bowl. This is the second year that's coming up um, next month, but also some of their um, programming and being on those broadcasts and, and getting out um, the message through public service ads and so on. So it's been a great partnership with them uh, and we'll, hopefully that will continue. Next one. We also have partnerships with media companies and entertainment companies. And in, in the case of many of them like Netflix and others, we actually provide consultation as they develop storylines and content to make sure that it ac accurately portrays mental health um, and, but also that it's safe storytelling. It doesn't add to any kind of continuation of myths or, or anything that could be dangerous. Next slide. Seize the Awkward is a campaign we have. It's all on social media with the Ad Council and also with the Jed Foundation. Next slide. It, it is aimed at youth and empowering young people to help a friend who they see is struggling. It's had an enormous amount of pickup uh, it's a couple of years old now, 58 million video views, uh, over 50 million in donated media. The impressions are just you know, enormous. Um, but one of the most important things is uh, about half of the young adults uh, in the survey were able to recall one of the PSAs. That's pretty amazing. And, and also two thirds um, of young adults did talk to a friend about what they were going through. So it really helps empower them. And there's a whole website, a whole program built around it. Next slide. I uh, just quickly on this, this is not released. So you're getting this before uh, we release it. It'll be released in October. What we did do a Harris public opinion poll, with some partner organizations, uh, adults, it was adults, not youth. 
And what we found, uh, we've done it a couple of times now, and it's, it's changing, but it's consistent too. And that is there's a continual increase in what we would call mental health literacy and in people believing suicide is a preventable cause of death. In this last survey we're about to release, it's 94%. That is almost not even believable. <laughs> Again, it's perceptions. It's not, it's not uh, facts. Uh, and, so, and people say they would do something if someone close to them was struggling. The problem is they're not sure what to do. And this comes up too, in terms of the need for more education on what to do. And also what came up in this survey was the difficulty as we've talked about accessing and affording mental health care. So uh, there'll be a, a micro site with this. We're happy to share the link to that where there'll be a lot more data coming out of this uh, public opinion poll. Next slide. So we have lots of partnerships. Um, again, uh, we can't do this work alone and we work through lots of groups as all of you do, I'm sure. Next slide. Just to finish up here, I wanna talk about Project 2025. It's been an effort we've been working on now uh, for about six years, seven years. And, and it, we set this goal to try to reduce the US suicide rate 20% by 2025. It was aspirational. It certainly was bold. Uh, at the point we set it, the suicide rate had increased every year for almost two decades and slightly, not dramatically, but going in a certainly a clear upward trend. So to try to bend that curve and bring it down, is certainly a ambitious task. Next slide. And what we found, we did a, a, quite a deep dive. We found four areas that we felt if we could um, make some changes in those four areas, we could make a pretty quick and dramatic impact. One, the numbers are large in terms of people who die going through these systems and also with firearms. Firearms is a public health approach and the others are all systems and, and settings, if you will, where you pick up people who are suicidal. And, and we also had evidence-based interventions or things could be done across these four. So we adopted these four and we set it up as a project to see if we could take some things to scale and get some impact. Next slide. So we're still way into this, um, and it, this is what it would look like. We set this at the very beginning, what it would look like if we were successful in bringing down the rate. You could see it going up pretty consistently from the early 2000s um, right up to uh, when we launched this project in 2015. And it did continue to go up, which we expected, uh, and then start to turn down. Here's what's happened. Um, if, next slide. It has taken that bend in the last two years. And you know, that uh, is during COVID, not all of it. The first year isn't, the second year is. Um, and so again, I, I don't wanna say that the project did this alone, it didn't. Um, but what we are finding is that, you know, it's, it, it's promising that if you invest in prevention, we could bring this down. Now there's concern, um, two concerns, one, even though it went down at a population level in 2019 and 2020, there were pockets or certain demographics where it didn't go down. I mentioned about youth and I mentioned, I didn't mention, but it's also youth of color. And so there are certain demographic groups that are not going down or going up. As an overall though, population-wise, it did go down two years in a row, which was really tremendous uh, as you, know, you could see how it was going up to bend that curve but it's not done. And there are some concerns in 2021 that the, there could be a delayed effect from the pandemic. And that's a concern that it could take a U-turn. So we're watching that closely and certainly want to see what it looks like in 2021. But it is promising. So it's an exciting and promising time. I use that word a couple of times here um, for our organization and for our cause. Uh, and again, we know we can't do this alone. And we really appreciate partnerships uh, and, and anything all of you can do um, to be part of this, uh, we welcome that and look forward to working with you. And again, I wanna thank Research America for this opportunity. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Bob. What a informative and compelling presentation. So many of us have been impacted by suicide, either someone we know and love or know someone who has lost someone. Um, so, uh, Thank you for what you do every day. We have a number of questions. Um, and uh, let's see, um, a number of times you referred to suicide being highly preventable. 
and you even cited a statistic. Could you share a little bit more about where that research comes from and um, how we know that? Yes, great, great question. So uh, what we have seen is there in, in certain um, settings, um, boundary communities where there's been an investment in prevention and you could measure the impact, mm -hmm. um, we've seen decreases when the best practices are fully implemented. We've also seen when those best practices are not supported and pulled back, that it goes back up. So, you know, it has to be sustained and mm -hmm. we know what to do. We know what, what kinds of strategies and, and uh, interventions work, but it's been really a challenge to get, um, to get them implemented at a scale. If everyone has safely stored their firearms, we would see a dramatic decrease in suicide um, because the numbers are so high. And so um, if the healthcare systems, and, and I have to just give a shout out, we have some great partners now in the healthcare space, American um, uh, Academy of uh, uh, Pediatricians is working with us, the um, American College of Emergency Physicians, a group called um, the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, so, you know, a lot of these best practices have to be rolled out and there needs to be trained in it and, and these systems. But, but what we've learned is if you do all of those things, mm -hmm. you will see a decrease. It can be, can every suicide be prevented? No, but sure. many, many more can. We miss a lot of people. So the challenges in bringing, bringing those known successful interventions to scale, are those challenges mainly financial? Are they mainly um, a question of a lack of trained uh, professionals or paraprofessionals? What, what are the main constraints to, yes. to really put in place what we know works? I, I think it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. it's, it's information and belief in it, you know. Um, so if you can, there's some data to show that if you have, um, if you could get firearm owners to believe there's a risk for suicide, they will safely store their guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they have to believe that first. So mm -hmm. some of it is the will. Some of it's political will as well. And that's starting mm -hmm. to get better. I mean, 988 was a good example. That was um, unanimous approval, bipartisan support. You know, it flew through and got, got approved. Uh, so there is growing political will for certain things. Um, so I, I do think it's, it's education. It's the data to show some mm -hmm. people don't believe that healthcare systems don't change easily. They want to see the data mm -hmm. and it's an expense and it is financial and it's a change in behavior. You know, so um, those are the things we're trying to measure changes in behavior, changes in attitudes, and then obviously changes in mortality is the ultimate goal. So of course um, we've got several more conversation, uh, conversations. Uh, I'd <laughs> like to keep this conversation going, but we have several more questions. So um what is the one thing that those who attempted suicide and did not succeed wish that they knew about? So, you know, I'm sure there have been many interviews and studies done um, of those who have attempted suicide. Um, yes. What are the top takeaways or can you not really generalize? Uh, there's a few things um, that we can from interviews of people who survived a, a serious attempt. Um, and, and one is they didn't really want to die. In that moment, their judgment was such they couldn't see a way out, and, mm -hmm. and it was in, to some extent impulsive. I may have thought about it for a long time, but that moment uh, mm -hmm. is very short. So there's an ambivalence about dying. People, people who die by to make a serious attempt don't necessarily want to die, but they also they're in such psychic pain, you know, mm -hmm. that they don't know what to do. The second is that if someone had come up to them and for a second diverted them they wouldn't have made the attempt. And that, that also helps to say, you know, if, if someone is, you know, really seriously attempting suicide, if you can talk with them about it, intervene, and it doesn't have to be a professional, you know, um, it can change the course. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, it's not that they really want to die. It's just they want relief from what they're feeling and need to mm -hmm. help through that moment. So there are things that can be done. And that's why the bridge barriers and you know, we, uh, firearm, you know, mm -hmm. safety measures and things sure. and, and medications, keeping those away, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from someone who's struggling are really important steps we could take. So we have two questions from two of, uh, of our patient advocates. Um, 
So as an organization that cares for those with rare life-threatening conditions that are also associated with chronic pain and frequent loss, um, what can we do to help those who reach out to us in mental health crisis? Uh, so one of the things that you know we would love to see more of is, and especially some of these, you know, not, and not just rare diseases, but other, you know, more common um, mm -hmm. me uh, medical conditions, is is some kind of training and information for the specialists in their field. I rem I won't mention the organization, but I was once told someone said, "Well, of course they're suicidal. They have X," you know. But, you know, I, I think there's more we can do in terms of training a broader group of professionals. Mm -hmm. it, and actually, it opens up something else just to say, it, and that is, you know, we don't think it's all the mental health field. Primary care and other specialties have a real role to play here because they're going to come in contact more than a mental health professional with somebody sure. who could be at risk. So I think for other chronic and rare diseases, it's really getting the information to the family as well, letting them know there might be risk, you know, and to what to watch for, and also for the professionals treating them, and to work with the mental health professional as well, if, you know, if possible, because these are comorbidity, you know, issues, mm -hmm. you know, so, well, that's you know, it's a great sync. question. Yeah, that's in sync with another question we just received um, about suicide being a, being a leading cause of death in people with chronic illness, um, most often due to lack of access to care, um, lack of access to financial resources like loss of a job um, yes. or a home, um, you know, waiting months and months for uh, social security disability. Um, mm -hmm. And also now the, the impact of long COVID. So um, this person, and I think you've, you've answered it to a certain extent, but is there focus in this area and especially for young to middle-aged men who yeah. for cultural reasons, you know, may just not know how to ask for help. Yes. Well, two, two things there. One, the last part first, and that is, you know, men do die by suicide four times more um, than, um, than females. And, um, and there is much less uh, willingness among men to seek help. So there is a gap there that we need to close. I think it's true. And, and, and the other piece, um, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, uh, first part of the question was more about um, folks with with chronic illness. Yes, 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 and, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think it's talked about enough. I think that uh, you know, it, it, we did list it in some of the risk factors. I think there's got to be more conversation about that, um, because when you have a chronic, you know, condition that changes the quality of your life, or you're in pain you know, you can become pretty depressed pretty quickly. And, and yet the treatment for depression for many of those folks is not there. Now there is a workforce challenge in that regard. And that, you know, we, we really are struggling in our field in the mental health field with it, but there is not the mental health workforce um, to meet the demand and the demand is skyrocketed as we talked about in, during COVID and, and that's gonna continue. So, you know, it's hard enough, there's barriers to asking for help, there's mm -hmm. stigma yet, but yet um, when you do, if you can't find help or you're on a waiting list, I mean, that's a lethal gap. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for some of these other chronic uh, conditions and so on to work more with the mental health field uh, to address the whole person, um, mm -hmm. the condition they have that's creating perhaps, you know, the, 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 the disability and, and the change in their life that's pretty dramatic, um, but also the mental health part too. So they've treated for, and it is mostly depression in those cases. Wow. Well, it's a lot to take in. It's critically important and uh, we want to work with you. Um, and um, so I think we're gonna stop our questions. Um, I encourage people to go on your website. Those really great social media graphics you have are available for folks to use. And there are a lot of other resources. There are resources about your peer-to-peer -peer, um, efforts that you have and just a lot of other really good uh, information that I think is very accessible and usable. So I encourage people and, and I wanna thank you, Bob. And again, just thank you for the work that you do every day. Um, oh. it's, it's not easy, but, um, it's, it's crucial and, uh, we, we stand with you. Um, thank you. Um, so before, 
before we close, um, I think by now you will you should have received at least one. I'm joking. You probably received about ten uh, announcements about our forum next Monday and Tuesday. But it's really going to be great. You don't need to attend the whole thing. You can go in and out. Um, but we've got lots of topics that cover, you know, all all of the issues that our um, alliance members care about. Uh, so the link is in the chat. Please register. Um, as I said, registering, you know, doesn't commit you to the two days. It just will give you access to those programs that are going to be most relevant to you. Um, so thank you all again. Thank you, Bob. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the forum. Thank right you. Now.